Hello and welcome back to the Resistance Podcast. Today we're joined by Debbie Hicks. Debbie, did you want to introduce yourself and let us know where we've seen you before? Yeah, sure. So sorry, obviously Debbie Hicks. Um, I think most people probably know um, that I'm the lady that um, got into all sorts of trouble for walking around the corridors of a hospital during lockdown at the end of 2020 over the Christmas period, and I was arrested and charged and convicted for that. So I think a lot of people got to know me from that, but I've been doing all sorts of things, not just that. Obviously, I organised lots of rallies, lots of actions, um, and the last two years, lots of Keep It Cash um, campaigning. So, yeah. So talk us through, let's just go through a little bit of how you got charged for doing a bit of journalism in a hospital. Yeah, journalism. I didn't see it like that. This is the funny thing to me. It was just um, a walkabout to see what was going on with my phone. Very amateurish. I'm not a journalist. I don't see myself that way. Um, and as you, if, you, if you remember, Boris Johnson had just called the uh, the new restrictions, the tiers. Do you remember the tiers that they put all the different yeah, parts? Yeah, was this 2020 when this happened to you or De 2021? December 2020. It was yeah. the, the week between Christmas and New Year. And he just announced these new tiers. And I can't remember the tier. I think it was the one from the top tier three, perhaps. I can't remember, which was quite restrictive. And Gloucester Hospital, my nearest hospital, said, we are overflowing. They put out a press release with people. We can't deal with this. Please do not come into hospital. And I immediately thought, I bet that's not true. I just have my suspicions. And I was also hearing things from people. They've been in, there's nobody around. The staff have got nothing to do. So I thought, wow, I'm going to go and have a walk around. And I uh, didn't think any more would come of it. I thought maybe 30 people might see my stream. And of course, lots of people watched. It was shared all around the world. Um, and when I put my um, live stream onto Facebook, I got lots of NHS staff jumping on, which has been featured now in this, this ITV documentary about what happened, jumping on and attacking me, saying, well, you, you, you walked around during a public holiday. You walked around um, the um, outpatients area. And I didn't. I walked around other areas, but they were sort of homing in on these things to try and discredit me. And I thought, right then, I'll walk back around the, the actual block. There's a block, a tower block, where you've got all the wards and you've got the ICU. So I did. So two days later, I, I I went back again. And of course, this time, I think they were on the lookout for people perhaps filming. And I was confronted by NHS staff that asked me to leave. And I even shut down my camera phone at that point because I didn't think it was appropriate. They came right up to me and said, Lee, and I did, and I left. And then within uh, within a day, I was arrested, dragged off to the police station and in a very brutal way and charged. So they came after you in the middle of the night, wasn't it? It wasn't the middle of the night, but it, it was about seven, I think seven, eight o'clock at night. And I I went to bed because I was really tired. And um, that's why on that footage that you've seen, um, I was in my dressing gown. Yeah. No. And they just came and grabbed you in your dressing gown? My husband, perhaps not realising, let them stand in the porchway, which obviously he realises now you don't do that. Let them come into the porchway, called me down from, from I was in bed. Um, and I, I knew straight away what it was. I could hear someone at the door. I thought, I bet that's what it is. Went to the top of the stairs, and um, I was really, I was really angry. I said, "Get out of, get out of my house!" I said, "You're not welcome in this house. Have you got a warrant?" Da da da. And the next thing, the younger one shot up to the top of the stairs, tried to slam uh, the the handcuffs on me, and we had a little bit of an argument, which is what the the, the video that went viral shows where we said, can't you at least ex uh, let me get dressed or let me go and get dressed and come down to the station? And he said, I'm going to give you one minute to go back into your bedroom and get dressed and then you will take you to the station. And that's what happened. No. So they grabbed you and then talk about your persecution, your your trial and yeah, conviction. Yeah, so I was very angry um, in the police car. And when I got there, I think because they could see I was very angry, they they seemed to have this perception that I was going to be violent. I don't know what the NHS. I mean, what I've I've now discovered is that the NHS, the trusts, were putting pressure on the police to be really quite forceful with me. This is what I've learned through everything I've been through. Um, but when I got to the custody suite, they put me in this kind of bay where they've got electronic doors. 
almost like you know when you go through pass uh, passport control and they've got these bays you go into now where the doors close. Have you seen those? Uh, in the police station. In the police station, yeah. and I was closed in there for about forty minutes, handcuffs behind my back, and. These handcuffs they use now, you, you probably know this. Yeah, don't you? I know. Have you, did you get they scars on your wrists? I did for a long time. Yeah, and they take quite a few years. It was to quite fade, painful, and I had. I'm sure this is what's brought, brought on my arthritis. Actually, is what they did to my hands. Not just on that occasion. There's been other occasions. What happens is it cuts off circulation, and what you get is you get this sort of jabbing pain throughout your fingers or you you feel it on the back of your hand and then you try moving them and then you get jabbing pain in another part of your hand and no matter what you do and they say oh you just need to move that hand oh just wiggle it a bit it's like you can loosen this and when it's behind your back because i kept pleading because obviously after a few minutes it's very uncomfortable and i said can't i at least have it around the front no no so it was like they were really sort of being extra um, horrible, vicious to try and wind me up. Yeah, they're being and violent. I was furious. I was absolutely furious, and I had to try and keep that in check because um, I just thought it was all so unreasonable. If they just dealt with it in a way where they said, "Right, come down to the station, Mister Hicks, and get dre- ready," rather than dragging me off that way, I think I would have been much more reasonable. Well, it's that they wanted, you know, they wanted a response. They so. knew where you lived. They yeah. could have, you know, uh, yeah. what what are you going to do? Are you going to go on the run? No. So they could have turned up, said, look, we've got a warrant here. Can you come in some point in the next week? In that yeah. time, don't cause any trouble because we've got our eye on you. Yeah. Problem solved. You come in yeah. of your own volition. And this is what happens with, um, I think, it, was it was it Boris Johnson and whatnot? They they get to go voluntarily. So if you're a politician, you're someone of importance. Yes. No, you, yeah. you don't get assaulted. You don't get, you know, cuffs slammed on you. You go in, you speak to them, or they will even come to you and they'll sit down and they'll go, yeah, oh, right, yeah. let's take the report for you. But it's a two-tier mm. system, isn't it? Yeah. And it's, I think it's a deliberate kind of approach, a psychological approach to try and get you to react, to maybe get you to become violent so they can say, look at this person. So then they've got, you know, they've got you in that position. So I was very aware of that as well. And I tried to keep myself calm, but I was very angry and I was questioning everything, um, being very demanding about my rights as well throughout the whole process in the custody suite. Um the awful thing was that they um, they brought in what they call a responsible adult from a local charity. And I found out what the charity, I've forgotten the name, it's a local charity in Gloucester, because they said that they tried to infer, they never said it to me, that I didn't have mental capacity. So, so they, they were, were trying the mental, they were really trying the mental health route with me. But, and I kept complaining. I said, I don't want this woman anywhere near me. And I was very nice to her. I said, it's no, no offence to you, but I don't need you as the responsible adult. I want my choice of lawyer. And this is what they were trying to do. They were trying to get me to either have her or the police station lawyer. Because when they phoned the lawyers that I asked for, they claimed, and I later found out it was a lie, that they would not represent me. Three different people they phoned, and they said they won't represent you. So they were trying to push me into this position where I either used theirs and I had this woman. And they got me into the interview room. It was about 12, 1 o'clock at night. And I knew straight away it's going to be a no-comment interview. I said, I'm not giving any comments until I have my choice of lawyer and I'm not having this woman in the room with me. And I said, you can do everything you want. I said, if this goes to, if you try and fast track this to court, which is what they wanted to do next day, I said, the judge will throw it out because you haven't given me the chance to get a lawyer. And within five minutes, he closed the papers, he said, you, you're going home. Um, and I was out by about, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning. So, so it was this process of trying to wear me down. And it was a big learning curve for me about what the police are, what the police are like. Well, I've, I've, I've had that. I've had, you know, you, you go in and they've, they've grabbed you and they have you for however long and you're in this cell and the lights are on. So you can't sleep, no, right? No. And, it's and you've like, got a toilet and they say you can go to the toilet, but there's no way you're going to go to the toilet, especially as a woman with a camera. And there's also no seat on the toilet as well. No, no. Well, there's so, no. There's not even a toilet tissue or anything, no. Yeah. So um, you're treated like an animal, basically. Yeah. I remember this one time I could barely get to sleep and then they wake me up at, because I've been saying, where's the nurse? Where's the nurse? Where's the nurse? Bring the nurse. Mm. Do a bit of paperwork. Takes 20 minutes. Log all my injuries. 
no nurse, no nurse, no nurse, no nurse, no nurse. Mm. When do they bring the nurse? Just as I've drifted off, right, after all of this, about 3 a.m., they interrupt my sleep. And then yeah. what do they do? Uh, I don't know whether it's 8 or, or, or 9 o'clock in the morning. Bearing in mind, I get to sleep at 2. And then at 3 or 4, they then wake me up for an hour to run around d- d- doing this whilst com- half asleep. So I've got to explain my injuries whilst I'm half asleep. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Then when REM sleep's being interrupted, that's when you go back to bed. Then they just switch on these lights in the morning. Yeah. So turn them off. It's the deliberate. Yeah. yeah. And also, no contact lens solution. Like So they bring you into an interview where you can't see, right? I've had it before where it's it's just been absolutely freezing And I wear them sometimes because I've got bad eyesight and I know what it's like. It gets to the point when you've got to change them, you've got to take them out. And if you haven't got glasses, then... It's basic medical care doesn't happen. Yeah. I've had uh, scenarios where they've denied me pen and paper. Why? I want to log down everything that's happened. I want to make notes of yeah, everything that the they're right doing wrong. Yeah, you have the right to do wrong. that, absolutely. Uh, they're, they're, they, they contradict pace. They yeah. are completely and utterly corrupt. Yeah. yeah. They don't... Yeah. And I think it's, it's it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I've had this discussion with so many people. Until you've been through that process, I think we've all been a bit naive about what the police are like in this country. I've always known they're corrupt. I've always known that. But wait, until you're on the receiving end, you don't truly get to see how it works in the custody suite and the kind of pecking order as well. Yeah, I um, mean, you 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 would like to think that if they are going to be corrupt, that it's sort of a, a, a one-off, Mm. And they know they're the, the 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 baddie, and they might have cut one corner just there. Like you don't mm. want it to happen, but you think, mm. okay, inevitably something's going to go wrong. Yeah, and you imagine sort of what was it, Gene Hunt in Ash- uh, the, a Life on Mars or Ashes to Ashes? <laughs> right. That, <laughs> yeah. That's if you you think if they were cutting corners, yes, they'd be out there risking their lives, getting the bad guy, and occasionally they do something dodgy, but that would be a one off. Right, I can't imagine someone like Gene Hunt coming after you in the middle of the night for that. He'd turn around and go, this is bollocks, I'm not doing this. And also for it to be over such petty things as well. Petty kind of uh, harassment. Really petty. That I suppose in a way, if you look at it psychologically, I'm not a psychologist, but you know, for those lower down the ranks, it gives them a sense of power that keeps them happy. Everyone's got to have a sense of power, What's haven't this? they? And I suppose if you're a lower rank person, police officer or whatever or a police constable and you get some power off telling someone to do this or that putting the light on it's it keeps them if they lose that sense of power and they feel other people have got it it's the stanford prison experiment is it yes can you give these people power and they start to uh enjoy in like yeah enjoy it yes but they, they are nothing without their uniforms they're nothing without their you know the 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 so-called prestige and these absolute normies who mm. worship them right yeah. the, the, i mean yeah. the kids the kids i tutor <laughs> you know so i actually had them go through all of the peeling policing principles whilst we were learning about the victorian era so we we're learning about sir robert peel talking yeah. about the establishment yeah. of the bow street runners we went through the peeling policing principles and it, it was great so they mm. had to read through the actual text of them then mm. I've given you know a plain English summary. I'm like, okay, you've got to match this up. You actually have mm. to analyse what is the meaning of this. So we go through, and we went through one by one, and we said, do the police do this today? Mm. Right? Let's look at the cases of how the police have acted, yeah. especially over the last few years. And all yeah. the kids are sitting there saying, no, the police don't follow this today. I, in fact, I, I just mm. think it's it's shocking that police are being sort of brought into schools as role models because the best yeah. thing you can tell kids right now is if you see police stay away from them they are yes. dangerous yeah. thuggish expect people. the worst yeah yeah don't yeah. expect them to be fair with you yeah, yeah. you know yeah. i i get concerned whenever i see you know a police speaking with a homeless person because yes, i just think, i do as well because i know i know what they're gonna they're gonna do yeah, yeah. i just think are they gonna start punching and kicking this this man yeah. are they gonna you know make up something and i've seen them doing it many times oh my god and uh, i've stepped in you know what i'm like i know when i see injustice and when i see people being unfairly attacked or harassed i get i get really angry and not long ago i witnessed that in funnily enough in london i'm trying to remember where it was now uh brixton Along the, the main high street. I went down there for a rally, funnily enough. And there was someone, he was just literally just sat there innocently. I don't know if he'd been drinking or whatever. It doesn't take much, a few drinks. But they turned up very quickly, pushed his face into the ground. And they do this new technique down there. It's almost it's a bit like what happened to you. 
And they held, and I was so concerned. I went over, and then of course, because I went over, other people started coming over, which is good. But that's why that's why they one. create their circle around yeah. to avoid uh, people seeing what was going on, right? Because that's mm. why they create the circle. Yeah. So, oh, it's to protect the officer. So you can't quite see. Yeah, so you can't the, see. And then yeah. what they can do is they can make body worn uh, footage disappear, like they did in the case of Charlie Staple. I don't know if you've seen our video on that. No, yeah, oh, no. you you'll have to look it up. It's yeah. uh, it's very well. Important. They did that with you, didn't they? Didn't they uh, say it shut off at a point? Uh, no, it was just the audio doesn't come in for oh, a minute. Right. So th w the audio comes in when they 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 click it. So, mm. but the video is always rolling on a loop and then deleting until right. they click record, and then you have the last minute. So it's right. waiting for them to actually click it, and right. until then, there's no. Audio. I've got one now. Good for the opposite reason. So I'm running, obviously, sorry, I'm sort of jumping the gun here. I'm running as a parliamentary candidate at the yep. general election that's just been announced. And I've been doing these street stalls every other week until now. I'm going to do them every week now. And we've got some, um, how can I put this politely, some of the left-wing uh, bullies. I'm not saying there's not bullies on all sides, but from the kind of Labour ranks in Swindon that absolutely hate me. They absolutely hate me for my anti-lockdown activism. And they've caused trouble before in Swindon when we've done rallies um, they've they tried assaulting me and somebody else before. One of them actually got charged, so the police did their job on on that occasion. And I've just decided, in case anything happens, I've got it here, and I can literally just switch it on. Well, that's so, actually how I started uh, Resistance GB. Strangely enough, I went down to see what was going on, and um, well, technically, I covered the court case first, but then I, I, I wanted to go and see what what the hell was happening at these protests. Yeah, yeah. and then I I bought myself a body cam. I was just like, after what I saw them doing, I thought, yeah. this yeah. is this is this is dangerous. This is worrying. Yeah. And then I, I was using like a it was terrible quality. But that's why all our old videos are terrible quality. But I, I tell people... But it's still that, got it out there, though, that, doesn't it? So, that, it, you know... It, and they've improved so much over the last few years. Now you get mm. ones that are tiny, they've got massive memory, the batteries last for yeah. much longer. Yeah. So I, I heavily encourage people to go and get them. Absolutely. Um, but, so you are standing. Do you want to talk quickly about where you're standing because i want to yeah. i want to talk about some of your other campaigns but tell us where you're standing because yeah. you need people to come down you need people Absolutely. to campaign because so otherwise it's just you <laughs> well this is the problem i think i'm running as the parliamentary candidate in swindon swindon north there's two constituencies in swindon swindon's a very big town actually it's a town um, and it's like a lot of places it's grown on the outskirts you've got commuter belt people that commute to london and reading and north swindon's very much commuter belt so lots of quite middle-class people that don't actually really, how can I put this politely, don't really live in Swindon. It's not, they don't ever come into the town, really. Ah, They're I not see. the old Swindon, you know, like you get that in place. There's a lot of people that have been there all their life. They've moved there out of town, 50 minutes cities. Because they've been pushed know. out of London, so you had mass migration into London. So they can London. afford to buy because they can't yeah. buy in London, but then it's still, I don't know, an hour's drive to London yeah. on the motorway, because M4 is straight, straight to Swindon. So I'm in the north. I'm running as the candidate there, which is slightly less marginal for that reason than the south. And then you've got South Swindon, which covers the town and the very working class areas. And somebody called Martin Costello, who is an ex-UKIP candidate, he ran for UKIP a few years uh, in 2017, um, is, has just announced he's going to run in the south. So we're kind of going together, even though there are some differences, we, we agree on a lot. And we're running on this Independence Day, um, which I keep getting these visions, as I said to him, of spaceships and, I don't know, we don't want Will Smith in the vision, but spaceships and... Um, well, you're the new Will Smith. Well, well uh, Do you know, it, it'll what, be beach, like... Beating uh, the aliens. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It'll be like, uh, they, they keep doing all-female remakes. So you can be the Will Smith and um, he, he can be... I don't know. What was it? I'm trying to remember the Jeff characters. Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, he can be it. Jeff Goldblum. He's a bit of a dodgy yeah. one as well, though, isn't he? Because <laughs> they all are. Um, what's come out about him? Um, I'm pretty sure the character he played was just Jeff Goldblum. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a bit, bit weird. Jeff Goldblum as Jeff Goldblum. Bit of a weird. But yeah, Jeff Goldblum, Will Smith. I can't remember. Who Please, else let's was... not say Jeff Goldblum anymore. It's becoming a nonsense. Yeah. But anyway, um, I've got Independence Day anyway. So that's us. And we're trying to push other people to use this kind of like a hashtag as the kind of thing to, to, so we can bring ourselves together and say we're all independence running. We're not controlled. We're not controlled by political parties, um, which is, do you know, it's so refreshing. 
it's so refreshing because that was why I was a Labour activist for years, as you know. Um, it was quite high up in Labour actually for quite some time. And um, were you almost on track to become an MP? Yes, there is a story behind that. Um, Shroud, where I used to live, I was very active there, um, very quickly actually, um, because I'm very busy in the sense of I get on and do stuff. I think people could see that I was getting out and organising actions and rallying people. And I was trying to sort of re-energise things. It was the time that Jeremy Corbyn was leader. And I was very kind of energised because I thought, you know, this is a new leader that might do things differently. I, <laughs> I thought, yeah, um, lockdown came and that all changed, obviously. Um, Wrong Corbyn. I thought he was refreshing and I got behind it. I really did get behind it. And I put my uh, my heart and soul into campaigning in Stroud. I was very well known in Stroud. Um, and as ever, this is politics, isn't it? And I, I was a bit naive, I think, to realise that if you're good at what you do and you're active, you very quickly get uh, people being competitive with you, not in a nice way. Yeah, you you, uh, you you make enemies, and especially if yeah. you stand on principle. So this is what I found being in the Tory party. Yeah. Right? People love that you're out there and you're doing loads of stuff and you're putting in loads of energy. They go, oh, yeah, we really appreciate... Because someone needs to do it. <laughs> yeah, because they, yeah. They, they've, they've got zero activists or yeah. next to none in a lot of areas. So they love people going out and doing the work. Yeah. But then you go, okay, well, you know how we've been in power for about, you know, like, six seven years now and we said we were going to bring migration down to the tens of thousands and mm. you know how hundreds of thousands of migrants are coming in and you know pushing up house prices whilst depressing wages meaning that you know working class people are mm. absolutely stuffed um yeah it's, it's should, should we should we not you know be calling that out like you know and they're like no no we've got to be loyal to the party we've got to be loyal and i'm like I'm loyal to my principles. The yeah. party is a vehicle for getting these principles yes. in, right? Yeah. This party is standing upon the principle, mm. which is bring down migration because we shouldn't be swamped. Mm. Um, yeah. Same, same for uh, the uh, the the deficit and the debt, right? I mm. don't believe that. Go do you do you believe that government should be able to borrow money? I think, no, no. I mean, I think we've got to the point where it's, we're just in a debt-based economy and we need to get away from that. It's, it's you know, we've got to go. Actually, this is in my, where's my leaflets? This is in my my policies as, as an MP is we need to get back to, we had, need to have a money system where it's based on the value that people create, not a debt-based economy. So Gold or silver? Well, backed by gold. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Wonderful, because yeah. if you actually look at you know what what they're doing now, you know they they'll get in a deposit of say ten thousand, and then they can mm. just spin up ninety thousand can be created. Yeah, so they get to just create this money, uh, which is inflationary, of course, mm. and then part of that can be redeposited, which then means they're creating more money. And well, it's not actually money; it's, it's just currency. It's got no intrinsic no. worth to it. It's got no intrinsic value. The only value really to it is the fact that. You are forced to use it to pay people um, uh, in terms of wages and you are forced to use it in terms of paying tax and you mm. must accept it as payment of a debt. And I, I don't understand why that should exist. I mean, even in the United States, uh, if you look at President Andrew Jackson, he vetoed the uh, create the renewal of the Bank of the United States because it expressly says this, in their yeah. constitution... Um, they show uh, Congress shall have the power to mint coins, which is specifically it is specifically mint because it mm. was to because they'd seen what paper money was like. They'd seen it was mm. useless, and in fact, they weren't going to have a national bank until they bribed George Washington. So it was Hamilton, right, who they do all of the PR for with all of their shows and whatnot. It was Hamilton and the rest of the sort of Federalist gang. They said, okay, we can build Washington, D.C. on your land or right next to your land, so you, mm. you will become rich. Okay, And that mm. was what got Washington on board, apparently. Yeah. Um, uh, which, 
it's, it's been corrupt from the start. But Jackson mm. said no, and uh, uh, it's, it's attributed, I don't think it really was, but it's attributed to him that his last words were, thank God I beat the banks. And he he won an election. The people were massively behind him, getting rid mm. of the, this central banking system. And then they had a free banking period, massive economic boom. And then what happens after it? Then they bring in all of these controls, right, which mm. are essentially central yeah. central bank by the back door. Then you've got the Federal Reserve, which calls the Great Depression, okay, mm. every single goal of the Federal Reserve, it has done the opposite. Yes, and they've yeah. been doing that for about 100 years. Yeah. And they've been lining their own pockets. Do you think it can continue this system that we're in, though? I no, mean, but, surely this is this is really what it's all about at the moment, isn't it? I mean, the, the fact that all these systems are sort of coming down and we, they're, we're moving into a new kind of economic system. So it's... And money system. The, the the one thing that they can do is they can continue to inflate. So they can continue to print uh, via mm. QE. And that enables them to keep inflating away all of the debt whenever they like, essentially, by mm. just ripping away from people's savings. Obvious, uh, people would say, oh, this affects the rich because they've got money in the bank. No, <laughs> it doesn't affect the rich because the rich have all of their money in assets, which always mm. re retain their value. What it does is it affects the poor who, if you're trying to save up for a deposit for a house or something like that, yeah. you are not going to put your money into assets because assets aren't easily exchangeable. It's rich people who are able to put everything into assets. It's poor people who have to keep it in cash because yes, they need yeah. that, uh, that, that change. Absolutely. And as a proportion of their income... Um, they need a higher proportion of their income to set aside in case of yeah. uh, emergencies. Because yeah. if, if you're on you know, 20 grand a year, you need to have a few thousand. Whereas if you're making you know 50 grand a year or 60 or 80 grand a year, a few thousand mm. set aside isn't a worry for you. So it's it's not like you're losing no. the same amount. No. Um, but yeah I, 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 yeah. yeah, I was asking about um, debt because I, do you think we should just turn around and say... Uh, all of this money that's been loaned to the government has been funding criminality. It's been funding terror, whether against our country, whether yeah. against other countries. Yes. You funded a corrupt government. We're not paying. Why should we pay? Why, literally, why should I pay? But like a, a tax boycott, you mean? Is no, that what you mean? Like no, I, I mean, I mean, if we were to take power, just as a principle, you mean? Yeah, I don't, yeah. but I don't believe government should be able to borrow money because what happens mm. is it incentivizes every single government that comes in. And I remember back in what uh, two thousand and nine, ten, uh, Osborne said, "We're going to come in. We're going to get rid of the debts. Uh, we're going to get rid of the deficit in two years." And I thought mm. that's a bit slow, right? Mm. Millet started showing in Argentina, you can get rid of it in one month. Yeah. One month. Um, but he said two years and I thought okay and then it, it was going to then the mm. debt was then going to be paid off over the remaining three years going up to 2015 so it was mm. it was the debt was going to be coming down um, that was, was completely thrown out the window because mm. they realised if we borrow money now it's yeah. always on the next government or the government yeah. after that or the government after that Incentives well, it keeps us controlled by these these banking interests that you're talking about, doesn't it? It's a co constant cycle of control as well over everything. Politicians um, are gone in five years. They're gone in five years. Mm. The, the incentive will always be um, borrow now and yeah. then I'm not here. I'm, I'm not here in five years. I'm mm. not here in 10 years. I've gone and got myself a cushy job at some, you know, yeah. uh, a fancy company. I'm, I'm a, an, an advisor or I'm a board member and I'm getting paid hundreds of thousands a year. Mm. They, they don't need to worry about it. They'll go to a think tank. They'll go to a policy institute. They don't need to worry about it. No. And no. that's... It, it, if you come in as a politician saying, I'm going to get rid of that, what will happen mm. is your own party will go, oh, but, you know, what's the incentive? Mm. Yeah, mm. you'll get punished for the it. The catch twenty two that why the system is is the way it is is that cycle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, tax. Can you imagine if they had to tax us every time they wanted to do something before they did it? Can you mm. imagine that? Can mm. you imagine they say, okay, so we want to send thirty billion to Ukraine. So what we're going to do is we're going to raise everyone's taxes now, so right. we get that thirty billion. Oh my god. Can you imagine? And can you imagine the tax revolt? Because they would have to do it in advance. Yes. You can't send thirty billion until you have thirty billion. Well, because there's the accountability has to be there, doesn't it? Yep, straight That's away. Why. Straight yeah. away. People should feel the pain before they get any benefit out of government. They should have and to. And that pay is it. funnily enough, I don't know if you see it that way. That is 
actually a form of kind of regulating in a way, isn't it? Even though you might not see it that way, because what you're actually saying is you, you're go we're going to have to do this with you and you're going to have to agree before we do something. Yep. Not that I disagree with that. I don't, but um, consent. Yeah. And also, yeah. Um, if you have, uh, I don't know what the technical term is for it, but I would call it subsequent taxation. So hmm. if you prevented the government from pre taking tax out before it goes into your bank account or into your wallet, I think government should have to come after you for the tax after you're already paid. Because you know that people talk about gross pay, right? So you're like, yeah. oh yeah, I, I make 30 grand a year. Definitely yeah. not me. Um, but people will make 30 grand a year, but then actually what they're bringing in is about 23 grand goes into bank account. Yeah. It's all taken out beforehand. Yeah. If you ban that and you say, no, 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 you send them a tax bill at the end of the year, like council tax, you actually have the potential for the people to rise up, withhold their tax, and you have the power in the hands of the people mm. to have a tax revolt. And I think that should be solidly it's, in our it's constitution. An interesting, it's an interesting point. And it's not one I've thought, thought about a great deal, actually. But I think, um, because I think, obviously, you're, you're not that we should make this a left or right issue. I think the left have always had this kind of philosophy, haven't they, that... Um, you know, taxation is good because we can use it to spend on public services. But rather than seeing that actually when you, you've you now got, which we have, we have got a fascist system where the corporations and the banks work together, completely together with, with governments, that relationship with taxation has gone completely out of control, you know, to serve that their ends, hasn't it? Well, that's Do how you know what I mean? So I think in a strange yeah. way, what you're saying would bring back um, a sense of public accountability. So no, absolutely. I think um, we we need to look at democratising um, taxation, um, which we don't really have any say over whatsoever, do we? Well, it's arbitrary. It's, it's arbitrary, isn't it? Because... And there's never a discussion. Do we ever hear politicians discussing these sorts of things? I well, don't think we no, don't, do because we? Because it's all constructed to have loopholes. Just that, about that... how to spend it, not yeah. how we have any accountability, how, how we get that money. How yeah, our, that our money. tax code is something like this thick uh, that no one actually can fully know it you've got some mm. people who are better at finding the loopholes and getting people through yeah. but it's created to have all these loopholes yeah. i'm personally yeah. uh, have you seen what happened in uh, estonia when they went to a flat tax so they said everyone pays same percentage rich poor doesn't matter if you earn one thousand mm. pounds a year yeah. you earn a hundred thousand pounds a year you pay the same percentage that way everyone feels the same pain because, you know, this old tax-free allowance, it sounds good. It's like, oh, we're going to help the poor. But then what you'll get is an entire constituency of people who will always vote for more government because it means taxing someone else. And hmm. I don't think that we should have a system which relies on people uh, relying on principle because, as we know, the vast majority of people aren't principled. The vast majority of people are sheep, I would say, Everyone pays the same percentage. Let's enshrine that in law, right, in the Constitution. Then, you know, you, you want more roads, you want more hospitals, you want more this, you want, want more that. Okay, well, cool. Mm -hmm. We are all going to pay the same percentage of our income. And I, if, you, if you want to pay 50% mm. tax, because that's how much it's going to cost, then at least you can't be a hypocrite. Hmm. That's, no, but very interesting. I think it's. Um, I think there was a time. I think politics has changed. I think there was a time when, um, as we know, taxation was going much more into public spending. It was, but now you know, I mean, all this with the water companies is a, is a fantastic example of how all our, you know, all the money um, is just going straight to the top. And into offshore accounts, all on you know, it's in every way is going that way. So where's the debt it, going? Where where is the debt? Like the interest that's paid mm -hmm. on the debt is just uh, yeah. it's it's parasited. You've got these vampires yeah. sucking the blood out of the country. Yeah, and I never borrowed the money. No, I never consented. But it goes back to what you're talking about, and it's these ultra wealthy one percent, you know, that have got billions of pounds in offshore accounts. To me. You know, I I know people always look at entrepreneurship and see it as a good thing, but I think it's beyond that. I'm, I'm not against entrepreneurship. I'm not against people making money or running businesses. I'm not that kind of extreme left. I'd see things like that, but it's it's this has just gone to the extreme because you've got all this money sat in accounts and they don't even use it. What what is the psychopathy of having money that you don't? It's not used for anything. And it's like you said, what do billionaires spend their money on? It's not like they go shopping like we do and put money back directly into it. It's what, you know, this money is just being 
hoarded. They're hoarding money. It's just, it's it's psychopathy to me. I mean, I, it really is. Well, I, see, I don't mind people hoarding money because technically, it, so if, if, if you have a free market system and someone hoards money, that is actually uh, deflationary. So that makes everyone else's money worth more. Can you imagine working your entire life, right? And you get all of this money and you never spend it. Well, that's wonderful for everyone else because you've worked your entire life for free, basically. And you've never mm. actually taken your coupon, which is what it is, and traded that in for someone else working for you. You've never mm. made anyone else work for you, which means everyone's got everything from you for free. Um, so I'm not, I'm, I'm okay with people hoarding. It's just the fact that it, it, where is the money coming from? It's coming from corruption. It's coming from a rigged system and it's coming from a but corporate don't you think, socialist model. But this goes back to the, the, this issue to me. Don't you think the problem is, if this is like it kind of goes both ways, doesn't it? It's a problem where a system where every, every kind of uh, accountability has been removed, um, you know, for what? 40 years 50 years in this country other countries as well with this system um that it's to me it's inevitable isn't it that people that might start off genuinely just wanting to reap um you know benefit from their you know whether they set up a business and they've made money like you said that because it's gone to the extreme where there's nothing to kind of stop that there's a psych i do think there's a psychopathy that kicks in where it goes beyond where the system then will allow that corruption to happen. I mean, I've just, I was just saying to Piers, I've just got back an FOI uh, from Swindon Council. Yesterday. Freedom of information. Freedom, freedom of information request. And I do them frequently. And I got very good of how to do them. And it's the question was, are there any private companies, trusts or charities running digital electoral services in Swindon? Um and I had a feeling it was going to be the answer was going to be yes, because it's about 70% of the country now where elections are run by pri a private company called Civica. And it comes back, yes, Civica is running, the, it's got the contract to run digital ballot and electoral services at Swindon Council. So you go to account. Yeah. I'm sure you, you've been to accounts I've before. Been to a few. And a lot of them are still paper counts, which is good. And they, they want to move us away from that, which is really dangerous, um, where you can see it all stacking up on the table. But then it's going into a computer and it's going into a cloud. And you've got this process where it's not transparent. It's not as transparent as the old fashioned system. I've um, I've never I've never I've never heard of that before. I, I know obviously they had ballot counters in the pre in not the last mayoral elections, which has just happened, but the one yeah. previously. I yeah. know they did that and they actually got rid of that and they went back to paper and they simplified the system. Yeah. Only because the Tories are worried about Labour rigging it against them. Yes. Um, but and there's uh, always been vote. I mean, digging on, there's I'm, always vote rigging that's been happening for forever. Oh, there's yeah, always, yeah. always corruption. But I mean, this but with, opens with it paper, it's so much harder because you yes. have to physically get the ballot papers. You have to physically go take your time marking. Yeah. You can just go tip it up like that yeah. and it's done. So uh, they take all of the numbers and they add them up. The and digital kind of calculations and I think it's probably you know small I don't know council election where it's hundreds of votes or something. I think it's quite and it's stacked up on the table and you can check it all with your counting mm. agents. I think that's very much easy to oversee. Yeah. But when you're getting into bigger elections like the London Merrill one in particular because that's very digital very mm. I don't know if you went to the count. I mean, I went. I, with, I wasn't at the count. I'm I afraid. went to the count with peers, and it was just absolutely shocking. And I, I was asking all the staff questions about how is this? Who's actually checking on this and overseeing this process? And nobody. They've got the. Um, I didn't obviously. I haven't been to the most recent one, but they and there's questions about that with Sadiq Khan. But they've got a machine like a scanner. It's a scanning type machine that's sucking up all the papers that have come in in the ballot boxes, hmm. and it's count it's counting them. And my question to the, there was a lady stood beside in this little area where it was doing it. I said, how do you know that's working properly and that it's counting them properly, you know, on the thickness of the, you know, how I, is it I doing thought, that? I and thought they got rid of the uh, ballot counting machines. They they told me in the, uh, so I, 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 I asked them when I went to vote and they said they got rid well, of it. Well, I don't know. This was in what, to 2021 and I stood there. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, so that one was the one where they used them and they've just got rid oh, of them. Oh, have they? I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. because that, so that right. was for the mayoral. So that was the first time it had been done 
And yeah. then I believe they've now got rid of those and they've gone back to the hand count. Right, okay. That's yeah. interesting. Well, that that's good news. I didn't know that. That's good news. But still, you've still got this going up into the cloud business. But anyway... That's what I and and that was anyway. That was my question to her, and she didn't even know. I said, "How? Who's setting the algorithms for this? Who's setting this up so that how it works? Well, how can you scrutinise a computer? Exactly. What? What? You You can't. No. And you know, I mean, I've got an electronic printer at home, and even the high tech ones. If you sucking up pieces of paper, you know, how how do we know it's not sucking two at a time or one? You know, or counting it differently. There's zero zero accountability and. Obviously, we've seen what's happened in the uh, United States. But going back to the point I was making, we've gone off slightly on a tangent, is that because you've got a private limited company, Civica, that's running 70% of UK digital electoral services. Mm. I mean, you've got the council still coming in and hiring their people, you know, that you see on election night. But that digital stuff is being managed by them. I find that very, goes back to the same question, how do we scrutinise that? And that was on my FOI. And do you know what I got back? I got back a screenshot of PIRA, the Political Parties and Elections Referendum Act. Just a screenshot of it. And it's like, no. So I'm going to have to go back again now. They're probably not going to answer. But my question was, how does the council scrutinise Civica and what they're doing? How do they make sure they're accountable? And I, I haven't got an answer because there isn't an answer. There isn't an answer. So How can you? You 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 must be terrorising them in Swindon. <laughs> well, I have yet to share this public because they've been so busy. Literally got this yesterday, uh, uh, the, the the previous evening. So I haven't put it out there. Um, and of course, the the editor of Swindon Advertiser hasn't even put my name. Surprise, surprise! As a candidate in the in the newspaper, even though they did a, a hit piece on me three weeks previous saying that I was running. So they know I'm running. Now you're not running because it's inconvenient. Yeah. They wanted to... Sm- Although the smear actually wasn't too bad as smears go. I've got used to smears. It wasn't too bad. Picture of me being arrested, um, being dragged off by the police, which now actually I'm, I'm using it's as... pretty heroic. You well, should put I'm, that as on your campaign I'm literature. I'm kind of using... This is what I'm doing now. I mean, you you kind of grow more and more of a backbone as an activist, don't you? And you, 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 you know what it's like. And it's to the point now where I like to always turn it around and like, well, actually, this means that I'm much stronger than all the rest of you. Would you see Robert Buckland? Would you see Justin Thomas and the MPs? Mm. Would you see them being arrested, standing up to the police for your rights? Yeah. Where were they during oh. lockdown when your businesses were being closed down? When your grandparents were dying in an elderly people's home, where were they? So I'm that's what I'm constantly doing. I'm turning it around now. And I've even got a, a new leaflet I'm designing with a picture of me being arrested on it. Yes. So... Uh, yes. I'm not shying away from it because to me this is why I'm different to the rest of them because I'm prepared to stand up and and be counted. But, yeah, I, uh, I don't think um, personally. I, I don't think anyone should be elected, or most people should be elected without well, I'm, having I'm, been I'm, thrown in a cell. <laughs> well, I, I'm unlikely to be elected. I mean, um, I'm I'm doing this as more of a protest thing. It's a protest. I'm hoping there's going to be a protest vote there, some kind of scrutiny if I can get into the um, uh, the hustings. Yeah. To use it as scrutiny, to highlight issues, that to me. And to start building as well, whatever system's coming down the line. And and let's be honest, you know, this whole great reset agenda that we're moving into, I don't think it's all certain that it's all going to happen. I already see lots of it kind of falling apart and not, not working very well. So I, I think we need to be in there to destabilise that, to kind of take it off the rails Um break it down so. so tell tell me about your um build you building alliances with other independents do you yeah. have a, a website that you're using to try and build these alliances are there any other existing alliances of independents because i know there are a, a, f- a few different ones are there any that you're working with are you going to try and bring them all together i haven't actually purposely set out to set up some kind of an alliance or anything like that. But I am in contact with people. And I do think we need to be a little bit more... I don't like the idea of being too organised because I think that's our our power as well, is not to be too organised, mm. as you know, as a freedom movement. But I think we need to be in touch with each other a lot more. And I am in touch with all the Gloucestershire. They've set, just set up a group and they had a meeting last night and they're fielding candidates mm. in Gloucestershire. Um, I'm in touch with people from Manchester who are are putting up candidates, Leicestershire, um, trying to think who else. Um, And then obviously in Swindon, um, as I mentioned earlier, we've got Martin Costello, who's been an anti-lockdown activist from the beginning. And people can find him on Telegram. He's got quite a big Telegram Telegram channel. Um, 
t dot n- trying to remember how you do it now, t.me forward slash Martin Costello. They'll, they'll find him. They'll they find him on, him on Telegram. It's a public channel. And but you, you've got your own Telegram, haven't you? I have. It hasn't got, I've only just set it up. It's the same t.me forward slash uh, Debbie Hicks for Swindon North. Yeah. Cool. No. Yeah. So, ho- well, I, I think what we could maybe have is some sort of, I don't know, declaration of, rights I, 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 or, or some some agreement that you stand by these basic principles so yeah. if if candidates stand by these basic principles it could be more of a confederation rather than a federation yeah yeah um so the idea is you are all separate you do yes. your own i thing. think it has to be that way it's the only way yeah. it's going to work because we're all um quite maverick characters in different yeah. we're all kind of quite uh single-minded um which is why we've all got to this position i think where we know each other actually and i think we have to keep that which is what Martin and I have agreed. We agree on a lot, but let's never put ourselves in the same bracket to say we're we're campaigning on the same things. Yeah, we're just working alongside each other. Yeah, and um, you you are the anti-establishment or pro-liberty candidates who are standing up there. Yeah, so um, we have to. I agree with you. We have to keep that, but we do need to have more communication. And I am going to a meeting next week in Gloucestershire just to kind of talk about how we, when the election, how we just kind of have a bit more of a strategy with each other. So we, we help each other more than anything. Well, hopefully so. we, we can see some of that. Um, I wanted to, uh, if it's if it's okay, mm-hmm. um, may I ask a little bit about your Keep It Cash campaign? Yeah, Because we were yeah. talking about the banks and yeah. the system. Yeah. Uh, why should we keep it cash? Why should we keep it cash? And obviously your inflationary argument comes up a lot about cash. But to me, I think you made the point, actually, that for most working people, cash is freedom. It's for everyday people, cash is freedom. It's, um, I could still, only just, I could come to London if I did it all in cash and people wouldn't know where I am. Okay, they might see me on the cameras if I've got a hood up or whatever. But you still got a certain amount of freedom at the moment with cash. And once you take that away, the surveillance is like 100% in my opinion. They can watch everything we do. They know what we're doing, how we're spending. And more specifically, not so much the surveillance, but the programmable money that will come with going cashless, which is what Bank of England is already talking about, as you know. And that's that's moving very quickly towards that programmable money system. And as you you know, programmable money and it's already kicking in. Yeah. I mean the homeless, I've done homelessness campaigning for years and years. I haven't been doing it the last few years, but I, I used to do lots of campaigning in Gloucestershire. The homeless, they've been trialing since the lockdown, I mean, the lockdown was the trial for everything, wasn't it? Yeah. They've been trialling programmable money on a phone app with the DWP, Department of Work and Pensions, and with, um, you know, like halfway houses, um, charities where they house people that are homeless. They've been trialling their, they get their money, they get their universal credit, they get their benefits from the DWP, and it's on a phone app, and they can only spend it on certain things. They can't get cash. <clears throat> and why do they trial it as they always do on the most vulnerable? Because I know this sounds horrible. No one sticks up for those people. No one gives a damn whether the homeless guy at the end of the road, because what they're going to turn around and say is, well, at least it's going to stop him drinking or at least it's going to stop him getting drugs. So there's a, as with all of this program, well, there's like a rationale there, isn't it? It's mm. like, well, that's good, but it's this creeping. It's carrot stick. Yeah, it's, it's creeping it's, coming uh, in. It's a brave new world. Yeah. A and brave I've... new 1984. Yeah, <laughs> and it's terrifying because the supermarkets have been doing it for years, and I don't think I realised years ago that the, um, you know, the loyalty card systems that you get, you know, when you go into Tesco's, is all about getting your data, getting your data, reeling you into the system so you think it's good. Oh, I'm getting a, um, I don't know, what is it, the meal deal, £4.90, yeah, yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, pence off a meal deal, I think. I think it's quite a big difference now as well, isn't it, on some of these these deals. But anyway, you're getting a good deal, and in exchange they're getting your data, but obviously the steps are coming down the line. During the lockdown, I think it was um, NHS workers, teachers, wasn't it? The, um, you know, they, they were the ones that were getting the rewards, weren't they? Do you yep. remember? Or free, I don't know, takeaways or giving them free takeaways, all sorts of things. So you can already see how they started bringing this in in a way where it seems really good that, that good people are rewarded because they're good and they're they're I, doing a good job. Yeah, 
and, and we're... It, it's a class system. It's a class system. I remember yeah. when I was uh, working at a bar before, <clears throat> and it was when everything was winding down, and uh, this most arrogant cow came in. She's like, "Oh, is this very expensive? Well, I'm I'm an essential worker. Can I get a discount?" And I just went. No. Oh, but but I'm a nurse. I'm like, I can raise the price. <laughs> and I still, I still I, I can, I can add a gratuity if you would like to, uh, you know, after you, you get your government job and your government pension, right? Then uh, the amount that, you know, the state workers get paid mm. and the state state pensions, and I'm not mm. just the pensions for everyone. Yeah. The pe- oh, this is it. The pension pot doesn't exist. People talk about the national debt. I don't call it national debt. It's state debt, not mine. Um, mm. But the actual debt in terms of pension liabilities, yeah, I think it's five or six times the GDP. So we're talking mm. about uh, 700% debt. That's everything yeah. produced in an entire year. It's in, in a seven years of debt. That's with no one, with not a single penny to spend on food. So mm. phew, that, that can't be paid. Hmm. But the other, I mean, the, the, the cash thing is important on that level to me more than I think because you're going to have a growing, which we have, we've got a growing poor, working poor, as they call them. We've got a growing kind of poor group of people in this country, and that's going to get worse and worse as the years go by. And um, I just think it's autonomy, it's freedom. And the general public, I have to say, I've been all over the country, the general public, they, of course, they get, they get it. Even young, younger people I talk to. Some of them are indifferent to it because they're so conditioned to tap their phone everywhere. And also it's that debt thing comes in at Wills because they, um, and that's another thing. Some kids are now growing up with this this app called Go Henry. Have you heard of it? Uh, yes. So Where I, they manage I, their pocket money. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I just think piggy bank. Like I understand the principle. The principle is um, you reward them for each task. And I think that's the the reward system yeah. is 100% Absolutely. fantastic. Absolutely. That's how I got my pocket money. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, because I always recommend this to the parents and some people mm. turn around and say, you're not a parent. I'm like, but incentives work. It's yeah. Basically you don't economic. get it until you've done it. Incentives, Absolutely. incentives work. Don't give, honestly, don't give your kids pocket money unless They've they done earn something. it. They've uh, yeah. done uh, That's the way to go. But make them rich. And good behaviour was part of that. Well, maybe that's a social credit system kind of thing. But good behaviour was also part of that. Have you been an absolute menace to your mother all week? Why should you have your pocket money? You know, there's just, just some kind of basic rules and respect for money and the value of money. But yeah, I... I also, I don't... child labour. Child labour is wonderful within the home. I think from a certain age, they should be cooking the meals. I think they yeah. should be doing a lot of the... Yeah, doing cleaning. the laundry, cleaning up. Because yeah. if you think... Yeah. If, if you were going to be doing all of that... Yeah. How much are you worth an hour? Yeah. Versus how much is your yeah. child independently going to go off and earn per hour? Mm. And... It, the thing is, your child can actually feel like they're rich. And if you work one extra hour or two extra hours yeah. a week at work, but you say five hours at home, yeah, okay, where you, not good hours, like time when you're literally there scrubbing away. Yeah. Um, I think that that's wonderful. And your kid's going to be the richest kid in the background. Yeah. <laughs> but going back, I mean, the reason to me that has to be cash pocket money. And my son... Is, is very good with cash actually because he's been with me with this cash stuff. I mean, you've met my son. Your son is And excellent. he, you know, he's got his cat, he gets his cash money. It's because, it's again, it's learning the value of money. When you go into a shop, and this is why cash has gone up in circulation. This is the biggest reason as well, actually, because it has gone up in circulation by about, I think it's, it's almost getting on for 10% now. It's really going up. And this is you at the forefront because well, you are, I would say, you are, are you are one of the number well, I, I one th- activists. I think I've helped put it on the agenda, certainly. Yeah. I mean, I, there's other people doing stuff as well, but it's, Getting it on the agenda, isn't it? Which which is what campaigning is about. Is and also because politicians, you know, you've got your Nigel Farages that want to claim these issues as theirs. Um, it doesn't matter, but if you get these people talking about it, uh, I think it's it's um, progress. But anyway, going back to that, it's it's that idea, isn't it? Is you can manage your money if you go to the shop with a twenty pound note and you discover you you can only I don't know two coffees and two sandwiches. Your money doesn't go anywhere. Whereas if it's on a phone. And you know you've got a, 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 a bank overdraft or whatever. There's no concept of money and value, and, and a lot. Of, I think the younger generations are. Going, I mean, I see them tapping away, and I'm thinking, you know, where is this money? Where is the money coming from? You know, it's, have you ever worked in schools? You, me? Yeah. 
I've, I, I used to be a teacher and lecturer yeah. in colleges. I've worked at a couple of universities, uh, so a little bit older, so students, yeah. But um, Well, there was this great math system, um, and I think, it's, I, I think it's Singapore maths. Um, what they do is, and I, I believe it's a wonderful system, because mm. maths for many kids is too abstract. They hate yeah. the abstraction. Yeah. It's like this number, this number, this yeah. number. Like, but what are we counting? You know, yeah. that's why they try and say, oh, this many apples and this many oranges. Yeah. Um, and then how many fruits have you got? Um, what they do is they use blocks, right? So they start out and they go, okay, what six blocks add five blocks and then they actually start with physical blocks so the kids have the physical blocks mm. then they draw little squares for each of the blocks so they draw that physical they, they draw that in their books they take mm. physical then pictorial and then they then transfer that into numbers so they they, they uh, there's a clear link in each stage between the physical and then the numerical yeah, the, the, the symbol that we use, yeah. and I think it, it is really good because it helps cement maths for a lot of kids that just can't. Yeah, they it just doesn't feel like something solid. It's just not no, something no, that no. they can I grasp. Understand, I understand that. And I do I, because it's yeah, yeah, it has to feel like something that you can utilize, doesn't it, in a, a real life skill, um, which is always a complaint for most people with maths, isn't it? Things like algebra, and they don't see, you know, they don't see it as a day to day skill um luckily i mean i i never got on with maths at, at, at uh, school but luckily my son is very good at maths he's doing his exams at the moment actually for maths but and it's exactly that i've looked at the, the papers you know the past papers when we've gone over them and it's it's just so i'll be honest boring yes I mean, it's just got no <laughs> link to real life and i think um and i know there's a lot better maths teachers nowadays than when i was at school i mean they were dreadful when i was at school no idea how to teach it but i think a lot a lot of teachers now are getting better at techniques and finding ways to make it. Using, I, I using heard all systems. sorts of. I think this applies to cash though, because once it's on the card, not only are you not seeing it, or you're just seeing some numbers on the terminal pop up for a second, you you don't have to physically touch it. You don't have to physically count it. You, it, it's it's the abstraction of money which then yeah. enables people to get more and more into debt, which yeah. I'm sure a, a lot of people are guilty of. Probably myself at different points. Well, it's it's very easy to get into debt. I mean, it, it is because it's so it, it has been so accessible to people. I don't. I think that's changing very quickly at the moment, though. Actually, I mean, mortgages um, are very inaccessible to people now. Mm. So I think all of it it is changing in terms of access to money. But um, as I hear from so many people, but there's still that that idea that you can put it on your credit card, overdraft. Um, and I and I, actually, I think the the cash circulation, which is why they're in a bit of a quandary particularly in this country, where they wanted CBDC and programmable money to kind of be further ahead than it is already, I think. They've had to put the brakes on a bit because there's been opposition. Cash is going up in the circulation. And I think it's one of those things that everyday people think they can have a bit of power over. They don't want to go on a march. Mm. They don't want to be on a demonstration because it's not really, let's be honest, it's not really a British thing to be like that. It's more of a French thing, isn't it? It's not really part of our culture. But... Oh, you something... say that you've got the you've got the Jarry marches, you've got the Chartists, you've got the yeah. Peasants' Revolt. Um, okay, we have had a fair few protests. The only thing is, mm. we have uh, rain. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, they do in France though, as weather. well, don't they? But yeah, yeah. No, I know what you mean, but I mean in the sense of I think we're we're not kind of as radical as other people. I'm not saying we don't we don't. Re I think we're more reactionary. Than we are revolutionary. We're more reactionary. That's my my opinion of, of watching and getting to know people over the years with activism. And I just think that the cash thing has taught me that when I talk to people, I'm stunned at just how awake they are about money and what losing cash means. They get it. I mean, they they really get it. And the reason you can talk to people about it, which is why it's been so lovely for me to campaign on, is it's not an issue of left or right or political ideology. It's just it's just about cash, and they get it, and I and it, it breaks down all those divides as an activist. And I can talk to people, um, and they they understand that you know using cash is is for them to keep a little bit of their independence, their autonomy, their freedom, and uh, and managing their money, and their weekly budget. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think as well um, the uh, prohibition of, mm. of uh, let's say weed, but also other yeah. drugs, but primarily weed is going to be a major, major factor within this. Because mm. how much of the country smokes weed? What is it, like a, a third? <laughs> so 
Is yeah. it a third of the country that smokes yeah. weed? Yeah. Um, th- that third of people, it's like, okay, well, game over. Is it that's game over for you? You literally will not, will never ever be able to smoke weed. What you, what are you going to do? Are you going to mm. start, you know, bartering chickens <laughs> or just <laughs> get yourself an yeah. eighth or something? Yeah, yeah. And that's an interesting point, actually, because I've had that discussion with people as well about where we've got a huge so-called illegal economy, shadow economy, whatever you want to call it these days. We've got a huge one, as as we have globally, as you know, and uh, it's, it's a big cash economy. Um, so how it, this all kind of chimes together about how they're going to bring in these... Because obviously that's the argument they use, isn't it? We're going to crack down on crime. We're going to stop all this. But to me, you're never... It's like everything historically. is You're never going to stop some of these age-old criminal practices. It just pushes them... It just push them somewhere else, won't it? You know, the, the way that people manage them. And, um... Well, they'll, they'll start trading in gold and silver, which, you know, given that gold has become so valuable. Um, mm. it, 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 and do I don't know, see them getting rid of cash. I don't see them getting rid of it it'll, anyway. It'll be but... cheaper for them to actually start smuggling in terms of gold. Actually, do you know what, right? You know how people are trying to, like, smuggle money across borders? Given mm. the price of gold, just... God, let's just walk straight through. (laughs) Like, that's how, I mean, that's probably the easiest way. If you've got standardized gold necklaces, you know their exact weight. You can Like Mr. T. You literally walk through Mr. T. Good. How are you going to prove that smuggled? I I think this is is what we need to promote. But you you said age old with age old practices. I don't know whether you're referring to prohibition because traditionally, we are a nation of international drug dealers. And we are a nation where people have been able to have the drugs they want, yeah. when they want, and mm-hmm. we have fought wars. We defeated yeah, the yeah. Uh, Chinese Navy That's true. and yeah. liberated Hong Kong in order to be able to uh, sell our drugs. Yeah. And I'm, I'm yeah. quite proud of that. It's these sort of um, illegal trades, if you like, that um, the very wealthy also obviously want to have access to. Um, well, they're all, it, they're all taking coke, aren't they? Well, yes, they're I mean, all, and all these politicians... <laughs> They're, they're all, they're, they're, I mean, and that's another thing, isn't it? We're getting back to the politics here. But, I mean, the, the state of our politicians, I mean, you, do you remember? I mean, he was particularly bad, but they're all at it. I mean, some of them are just better at covering it up. Um, George Osborne, you were talking about him earlier. I remember him literally like this with his eyes, you know, completely out of it in the House of Commons. And it's, you know, these people are sort of moralising to us about our social behaviour and what we do with our money. And... um you know these things. I mean, what do we? It needs to change, doesn't it? I mean, it's the. I mean, how do we change that? Is it just about changing the system, or is it? I mean, people talk about taking them into a new building and a new setting. I don't think that's going to change it. I think we just have to change the system before the kind of culture starts to change with it. Well, you you talk about changing the system, but what I would say is we need to, in a way, revert back to, for example, juries. Going back to jury unanimity, mm. right? Extending yeah. juries to say no one can be sent to prison without a jury. Yeah. Right. And keeping magistrates to simply fines. So no community service, no mm. community slavery. Mm. Right. Literally, the most they should be able to impose is a fine, and it should be a fine of a certain proportion of maybe the average wage. So you could say it could be up to a few thousand, but they can't put you in prison. They can't demand that you go, you should give 200 hours of your time in slavery. Mm. Okay. They can't give you an order to do this or do that or go to, you know, a brainwashing scheme where they get, you have to, yes, I was very, very naughty by exercising my freedom. Mm. I think we should just move to that. And that way, anything that's low down, like, you know, someone was rowdy in a pub, someone stole a Mars bar, right? These two people got in a fist fight in, you know, the town square. Mm. Sorted. Fine, 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 fine. Anything that's actually a proper serious crime. Yeah, then, you mean all these kind of petty crimes that clog up the magistrates' court? Because that's what the magistrates' court is a revolving door for. Is that? Yeah, it should be. It should be the the petty stuff, and the the only thing you should have is a fines. I don't believe anyone. Yeah. Like, look at what they did to uh, Tommy Robinson. I keep repeating this: six months in prison. Mm. And whatever we think of him, yeah, absolutely. And it's a, yeah, it's yeah. A, that's that's a, a, the, the, he has had no jury, and I think that's mm-hmm. disgusting. I think we have a right to a jury, yeah. And I, I think we just need to uh, abolish the power of some of the magistrates. And what's worse is the magistrates are meant to be volunteers. Yes. All right. So they're meant to be essentially like a mini jury. Of and what, some of them of, haven't of, even of had three. legal training. These these magistrates have they? Well, the, the idea is they have a legal 
they have a legal advisor because they yeah. are three volunteers. Which is why they often go off, isn't it, and they get, they yeah. get advice, yeah. So they're three volunteers. So it's like a mini jury of having three of them. Now what they've brought in are just mm. these district judges. Mm. Like, okay, so you've yeah. just replaced the idea had, of I a had, mini jury. I had with... the district judge in my case is in Gloucestershire. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who, who, the, who the hell are you? You're not even pretending to be my peer. You're not a volunteer. You're a full-time state employee. Exactly. How dare you? Yeah. How dare you arrogate to yourself the right to pass judgment on guilt or innocence? Yeah. That is reserved to the people. Yeah. Right? And magistrates are meant to theoretically be the people, just smaller form. I, my peers pass judgment on me, and I, I was I was I was saying this um, mm. not long ago. Um, you, and and, and is it right also? I mean, well. after what we've been through, is it also right, regardless as well, whether it's Palestinian campaigners, us or whoever, is it right that the magistrates' courts are clogged up with dealing with us? political campaigners mm. it's it's just a disgrace and they had to open all those new courts up the one that i was tried in siren it was been closed for years and they reopened it during lockdown because of all the petty you know i mean it's absolute ridiculous and and again let's go back to it it's generating a lot of income for people isn't mm. it you know it's another money-making thing yeah. well it's the rule of uh, lawyers rather than the rule of law because um, yeah. now what you have in parliament is just an endless series of lawyers making more work for themselves and more money for themselves and people rather than being able to go to court and represent themselves it's just this absolutely byzantine system where they put through in what it's 10 years they put through about 3300 new regulations or pieces of statutes it's impossible but saying that as well the other debate that's circulating and I, I was really lucky. I had a really good team, and a, a couple on my team were, were quite anti-lockdown, which was very really hard to find in, in, the, in the profession, as you know. Um, and they are the AI, as with everything, AI lawyers that are starting to come into to use now, um, which is what I think everything about the lockdown was about bringing in this new digitalized AI um, automated system. That's what the going on the screens was all about during lockdown was starting to phase in this system where it's all done remotely so i actually as much as we can say it's disgusting all this public ex cost on the magistrates courts and the the lawyers i the system that's coming down the line of of remote i i think it's far worse i, I find it i'm not saying that doesn't need changing but this system that's coming in is is, is terrifying i think and they're they are all quite worried about it and so they should be and this is the irony isn't it those of them that didn't stand up for us the legal profession during the lockdown when we were fighting for human rights um now on the we're going to be on the receiving end of that system that we're saying is coming in because they're going to lose they are going to lose their jobs a lot of them well one and of one of the problems is it's these the concept of a registered profession so whether it's doctors or lawyers the government has seized control of these professions meaning yeah. that if you want to go and be a barrister well you mm. you can't be you have to go and you have to pass their exams. You have to spend yeah. a ridiculous amount of money that they've artificially inflated yeah. um, in order to, to to do do what? Do a job that someone could easily hire you to do. Yeah, um, absolutely. If, look, yeah. if you happen to know about a specific uh, segment of law, you happen mm. to have some expertise in it, whether it's yeah. parking fines or whether it's um, someone who's been working with, let's say, uh, domestic abuse victims for ages, mm. right? Or people who know about prosecuting the police for stop and searches mm. right if you're literally just a person i know about this if you've got this i'm an expert people can do that they can give a, a, some advice yeah but you can't just go into court deal no. with it no. I, I think that if someone's an expert on stop and searches they should be able to just be be a, a, a lawyer for someone and they can constrain themselves to that at the mm. end of the day it's about people having their own choice and their own autonomy because all of the great lawyers uh, i think uh what was it garrow uh, Blackstone, uh, Coke, these mm. uh, men who apprenticed, mm. they they didn't have to go through a brainwashing yeah. scheme within yeah. the universities in order to be given a permit to be a lawyer. And it's just restricting the supply. It's another government intervention, which is controlling the market. Yeah, But that's like everything, isn't it? Whether it's being a teacher or a lecturer or a Doctor. you know academics that you know get their um you know their their papers approved and get their PhDs whatever it is you know it's a, a, being approved by the system isn't it so that you are part of the system and they can control you and it's like 
we guess we're going into another topic now, but it's it's, it's it's no different really to being a lawyer because the world, the, the academic world is the same. That's been my experience of it, is that anyone that wants to, for instance, do a PhD, and I was I did start a PhD and I didn't finish it because it was so expensive, but that's the same process. If you, you want to get funding, you've got to make sure you come up with the results that they want you to. Yep. That's the way the game goes. It's, it's weird because people in certain professions, they see the corruption in their own profession and then they just obliviously believe that all the other professions don't have the corruption. In. Yeah. You know, lawyers see it within law, academics yeah. see it within you know, the universities, right? teachers see it within teaching. But they go, oh no, it's, it's fine. We've got British justice. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Uh, um, absolutely. Because they, 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 they're kind of, there's a kind of a illusion, maybe a delusion actually there in terms of... And I think it all comes down to status very much in this country because I think people, once they feel they're getting a bit of status from something, they quite enjoy it. That I'm part of that world, you know. I'm an academic, or I'm a, I'm a barrister, you know. Like I don't get me wrong, a barrister is very good, but I'm a barrister, you know. And I've got my wig on today. They they like they like that. I think people, especially if they've come from nothing, I think those are the worst people that you know have come from nothing and they they, they enjoy it. I think so. Right, so quick fire. I want to know which of these you support as fundamental constitutional rights. So freedom of speech. Yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and you would abolish the concept of hate crime and also the Equalities Act. So hate crime. Yes. Yeah. In 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 what sense? In what legal sense? Though? The what? idea that you not only prosecute someone for a crime they commit. So if you throw a brick through someone's window, that is a crime. If you throw a brick through someone's window because of their race, they will then charge you with a separate thing on top. I think that's silly. I, I don't think it, your motivation well, because it's, it's wide open to anyone to say it's, yeah, absolutely. No, it's, um yeah, that has to be reviewed and changed. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. because the, at the end of the day, I, I don't care if someone's thrown a brick through my window because of my race. It's the brick that's come through my window. <laughs> that's the problem, mm. not their opinion. Uh, or political opinion mm. otherwise um, and the idea of seeing people as groups so you've got this special class and they can't be criticised because they're Muslim these people can't like be criticised like protected groups you mean cause they're, yeah because yeah, they're Jews and then this these groups it's can't all be gone too criticized. absolutely oh, it's a woman yeah. a homosexual it's all gone too far you know obviously the, the term we all use now is kind of woke this woke politics but no absolutely it's gone too far because now what it's used as is a kind of a a screen, if you like, a kind of a cover um, for other other abuses of justice, actually, which we should be focusing on and people's rights as we experienced during the lockdown. Or individual rights, because that's what you know, equality before the law is. And now yeah. it's being subsumed with this concept of you are a group, you must be treated as part of this group so you don't actually have rights in and of yourself. Mm. You've got to claim rights. Oh, well, I'm in the special group, so therefore I get to... Like, yeah. why, why, it, it doesn't matter. No, it's, like, it's, it's, yeah. it's all got out of hand and it's very divisive. Divide a division so, between people, yeah. Education, right of people to homeschool, educate their own kids. The, the right to do it, you mean? Yep. What, to increase the rights to, to be able to do that? Uh, yeah, just to enshrine them uh, in our constitution that people to should... To have a bit more formalised rights yeah, with, with for, that, because it's very vague at the moment, and, isn't and, it? And maybe even a voucher system so people can actually get a tax rebate and get use some that support. to stay at home. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I homeschooled my, my son and... There needs to be more support. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right to bear arms. The right to bear arms. That's really that's a really good question. Which because is if an you'd extension have asked me, of self defence. You'd have asked me that question five or six years ago. I would have said, "Oh my god, no!" But actually, after living through the last four years, and I, I'm sure I had this discussion with you before, I can understand why that was in the American Constitution. So yes, um, because what else have you got when there's a tyrant at your door and it's the government? What have you got? Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's just the right to self-defense against anyone. If if yeah. if you are a woman and you are not strong enough to uh, cock a crossbow, mm. you're not really strong enough to draw a bow, you're a weak old lady, mm. then yeah. you've got a gun. <laughs> no, it's, it's interesting that I find myself saying that. As I said, it's a complete turnaround for me because I never used to think that way. But I, I, it's like everything. Until you live through something, until you live through a tyranny, I, yeah, absolutely. I think we should have the right, yeah. Okay, uh, so we talked about um, uh, juries. You stand for jury unanimity? Yes, I think we, we, we need to change that, absolutely, yeah. Okay, and um, do you believe in uh, protecting our borders as well? Uh, protecting our borders. Yep. And, what more and, protection than we currently yeah, have? Having, I mean. having some sort of fundamental limit on migration and restricting the voting system to people who actually are British, because what we've seen is we've seen sort of colonies of people come in who mm. aren't British and then they will have 
children together with mm. other people who aren't British. And these children are the sort of paper citizens, but they're being raised by foreigners in this country. And, you know, the argument is, oh, well, they go to a state school. And I'm like, that's even worse. They're even, they've got even more propaganda. I think culture is descended. And if people want to come move here, they're going to marry a British person, then mm. sure, you've, you've got some sort of British descent. Or mm. if someone's adopted from abroad and they're raised. But as far as I'm concerned, are, this, this, are we going to get rid of this concept of paper citizenship, which I, I think is rigging elections? I don't believe the child of two people who's been raised as a colonist should have equal rights to me. I think they should have rights to vote in the country of the culture that they've been raised in. Yeah, that's a, it's, it's a good question. And again, it's something that I, I wouldn't say I've completely changed my mind on, but I do see differently the last few years. I think, to me, the biggest issue with immigration is it comes back to, we've got, we've got all, you know, the likes of reform, Rishi Sunak, this policy of uh, sending people back to Rwanda, we're going to get tough, all of this. And to me, it's absolutely useless, useless debates and discussion because they're not getting to the root of the problem. And they don't want to get to the root of the problem because, you know, there is a huge corrupt system around the movement of people, whether that's legal immigration or or illegal immigration. And the, the illegal immigration to me is actually the, is, is the big problem, even bigger. Um, and I think it doesn't matter whether you start changing laws on that or you're bringing in rules. It's not going to change it because, and this isn't just about the UK, this is the global economic system that we're in where we go back to our corruption again. Everything has been corrupted by mafias that are working in cahoots with governments and, you know, the, the trafficking, I mean, the amount of people that are trafficked in, into this country as well, mm. children, and also women into the, I mean, you know, the, the things that the left are, are so concerned about, but they don't want to talk about it from that perspective when it comes to immigration, you know, the tra trafficking. Uh, so to me, the victims, I mean, people don't want to talk about this. It's almost like, and I've seen this happen. I know Paul Martin, who's running alongside me, has been really abused and um given a lot of stick and called far right for trying to discuss these issues. And I can see that there's people that have tried to discuss this and have been shut down unfairly. But to me, it's looking at it from both sides. Not only does it cause division in our communities amongst people, to do with housing, to do with access to public services. And don't get me wrong, that's not, that's not actually the main reason why we've got a problem with that, but it does contribute to it, I think. Not only does it cause division in that way, but also, I think the pe for the people that are being trafficked, they are victims as well. They're being exploited. Hmm. Because whether it's the economic system that we're all participating that's contributing to these people moving around because oh, I'm going to get some work here, I'm going to do this here. You know, and that is the system and you can't blame them for doing it because that's, if you were, you know, given an opportunity, you would do it. So you've got that economic system that isn't helping their own countries. You look at these countries where this has been happening for decades now and that the hole it's caused in their economies, you know, yeah. for the people that have been left behind. So not only does it not help them, but you've got the other side, which we're, we're, we're really seeing at the moment with Palestine and Gaza and countries like that, not, not just there, where the militaristic occupation, not just the economic occupation of us taking over their systems so people move around, but the militaristic occupation and the absolute devastation that cause which of course is going to create refugees they I mean, you know you ask those palestinian people they don't want to leave there you they don't want to leave they, yeah, they you keep know. funding over all of the money and the weapons and so there's this constant cycle whether it's that or whether it's just economic um migration because you want a better advantage or to earn some money we've got this whole um very very deregulated very open very kind of like wild system that's created this this corruption of, and trafficking all around the world of trafficking of people as well and i think until we start changing to get back to a more national economy in this country hmm. where we're managing our economy a lot more and we're we're employing people within our our economy a lot more and there's and an incentive to train our own workers exactly. because you can't just you know bring in and this isn't uh, by any means also because i'm not actually completely anti-immigration because i think there's been benefits to a multicultural society i'm not completely against it but i just think like everything we've discussed today because it's all part of the same discussion to me it's gone too far mm. and i do accept and, and i'm by no means someone that sees myself as british or anything really i don't know what i am to be honest if, with my family but um I do think there's an argument in terms of recognising that 
when you're moving into potential tyranny, which, well, we are moving into tyranny, you have got to have national identity and you have to have people that come together over something. Yeah, you've got to have some um, some sort of common language between you. Yes, not more than common language, but I mean that socially. Something a common where we all social come together on language, yeah. a common understanding, common history. Like you can appeal to uh, King That's Alfred or King Arthur, right? Yeah. Or you can look back and say we did this in our history, and then uh, if if you have no investment, you go we. <laughs> and <laughs> I just think that's no completely we. been obliterated, and. Um, I mean, you ask people what does being British mean, and you get, all, and you, and a lot of people just be like, like that, and then obviously you get ridiculous answers like I don't know, chicken tikka masala, or do you know what I mean? You get all this kind of, you know, and they'll say that's multiculturalism. I'm not saying, like I said, some of this stuff hasn't been good, but I just think it's, and maybe, and I do think immigration's been handled so badly over the years as well. The waves of immigration that have come into the UK, I think. The politicians have deliberately mismanaged that so that people have moved into their own kind of solitary communities. There's a natural incentive. There's a, generally, people want to be with people like them. Yeah. Once you, e even when it first started, you, you, the, you know, down by, what was it like Mile End, Indian mm. area, right? Brixton, uh, West Indian area, mm. right? Yeah. You, people will naturally cluster. They're like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm going over here. Oh, your cousin's over there. Go stay with your cousin. You stay with your cousin, move to the house, the road over, yeah. right? You've got a, a, a mate. People will just start clustering mm. and then you've got the segregation. And look, I'm fine mm. if people within this country want to have little communities, but those are being destroyed. And what we've got is we've just got a, a replacement of our culture and a replacement of our people and mm. the debasement of our elections. Because I don't believe that a foreigner should have the, the, uh, the equal rights to me in my country. I don't mm. believe I should have equal rights to them in their country. But I'm, mm. but, you know, I'm in my country. I'm not in their country. Mm. So that's why I'm, I'm but, bringing yeah, it up. I mean, in answer to your question, um, in terms of that, about having equal rights, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm not sure what to make of that watch to say, but I'm certainly more of the belief, and I have to think about that. It's just an honest answer. I'm, I'm not sure what to think about that. I'd have to really th mill over. Um, but in terms of immigration, yes, yes, bring in a more... And they've already brought in this points based system. I was looking at the other day, but well, points points based still gives them the ability to pick and choose. And what a what a politician is sitting there with a central but plan. But that's been and corrupted, saying, though, hasn't we, it? But a politician yeah. says, "Oh, I think we need this, and I think we need that." I think if someone's essential, mm. if someone's really essential, there's a massive dearth of these people. Mm. Then a company will pay to sponsor their visa, auction well, that, them, that's... auction auction every single one of the visas apart from people who are married to a British person. So yeah. if you've actually got a husband or a wife, and then for family reasons, mm. sure, you'll need to get a visa. Apart from that, auction every single one of them. And if they're essential, then the companies will pay to bring them over mm. because they're essential. And if yeah. they're not essential, just leave it up to the market, right? Do, do a criminal check on every single one of them and say that will void it. But apart from that, just leave it. Okay, if mm. and, and there are going to be a bunch of jobs that are really small and specific that we just can't get the person. Why? Because you haven't got a group lobbying the government to put them in their you know grand centralized estate plan scheme. But anyway, I'm afraid that we are <laughs> coming to the end <laughs> yeah. today. Yeah. Um. So, give us the uh, details of where people can find out about your campaign and how they can actually come down in person to help you yeah well we haven't actually got a website yet we're working on that right now me and martin martin costello um from saturday i'm in swindon town center every saturday from 11 o'clock in the morning uh, running a street store which has been going very well i've been doing that for a few weeks already um we're going to come up with a schedule as well where we're going to go to different areas and leaflet we're not doing door canvassing because we just haven't got the capacity and the manpower to do that we can't do it and to be honest with my experience of being a campaigner i'm not sure it makes a great deal of difference anyway that's just my honest opinion um and uh, what else do we need help with yeah we need help with the leafleting coming and doing the stall and more than anything just getting the word out that there's an independent that's running well we see what happened in uh, uh, uh rochdale yeah. Independent getting second place. Absolutely. George Galloway, who was know, effectively they who an was, independent they? And they getting first. They voted for him, apparently. <laughs> yeah. What was it? Something like 22,000 or something? Or yeah. 19,000? Yeah. So if that can happen, then maybe there's a well, chance. There's... And you can put pressure and you can set the agenda, can't you? Yes. Well, it's it's Mike again, Rose. That's the way I see it. You know, it's uh, I don't see it as about winning. I think that's a big a big if but if we can make some inroads um and if we do get future elections and i'm very skeptical actually about whether we're going to have more elections 
another conversation about the Great Reset. They don't want elections in the Great Reset. They don't want democracy. Uh, that's what Klaus Schwab said, wasn't it? Elections. Did you see that quote he said? Was it at the, the last meeting, Davos? <sighs> elections will soon be a quaint thing of the past. That was his quote. Maybe that was his farewell speech. I don't know, because he's gone, hasn't he, apparently? Um, but i that's the way I see this. This could be the last of general election. Let's use it to try and get some some truth out there. Well, thank you very much, Debbie. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like, a share, a subscribe. Hit the notification button if you would like to help. We've got a Patreon and a subscribe star. So please head on over there and pledge us some support if you want to keep this journalism going. We've got a professional studio here and we could do with your support to keep these great conversations coming.